north of the border, they used to say, what will Scotland do when Margaret Thatcher says no to a Scottish Parliament? This week they're asking, what will Scotland do now that Boris Johnson has said no to another Scottish independence referendum? We ask commentators and SNP parliamentarians, what's going to be the Scottish response to the Johnston veto? Join us in the Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, where we present a programme on the constitutional future of Scotland. This weekend, and despite a blasto Jana win and a deluge of rain, another enormous march for Scottish independence took place in Glasgow. Of course, this follows another general election victory for the SNP, where their unionist opponents were reduced to a grand total of 11 seats compared to 48 pro-independence MPs. However, there is no sign whatsoever that Boris Johnson is prepared to accept that landslide as a mandate for a further independence referendum. This week, he wrote to Nicola Sturgeon, the Scottish First Minister, brushing aside her demand for a new poll. In a future programme, we'll examine in detail the Westminster response to the Scottish Government's demand for a further independence referendum, but this show will feature the views of commentators and parliamentarians on how Scotland should best progress its claims in the face of this veto. Today, we ask two top political commentators, Ruth Wishart and George Kerevan, how the drama is likely to play out. And we ask two experienced SNP parliamentarians from Scotland and Westminster, for their views on Wither Scotland. But first, Sure tweets messages and emails in response to our show last week. Lynn says, it's good to look back at the year. Now it's time to move forward and work towards Scottish independence. Scotia says, really love the shows from Northern Ireland, Catalonia and Finland. Far surpassed the output of BBC. Maureen says, love the show, Alex. Great to see all the folks that made your show so interesting over the year. Who'd have thunk it that Lembit's predictions would be so accurate? Have you gotten picking your horses now? Andrea says, can't wait until the day that programming like this is on mainstream Scottish TV. My favourite thing to watch. Thank you so much, Andrea. And finally, Tarya from Finland says, independent Scotland soon. I don't want to get a visa to get there. Now, the general election provided the Prime Minister with a mandate to get Brexit done. However, north of the border, things did not go according to the Johnson plan, with half the Tory seats crashing and burning. The other unionist parties did even worse, with Labour reduced to a solitary seat and the Liberals losing their UK party leader, Joe Swinson. However, there is no sign that Boris Johnson is prepared to bow to SNP government demands for the powers to hold another referendum, or NDRF2, as it's known in Scotland. These were the exchanges at Prime Minister's questions. The Prime Minister is a democracy denier. Can I say to the Prime Minister, as his colleagues privately admit, this position is undemocratic, unacceptable and completely unsustainable. The Prime Minister has shown utter contempt for Scottish democracy, for Scotland's Parliament, and for Scotland's people. Mr Speaker, it was not only the right honourable gentleman uh, who leads the SNP in this House, it was also Alex Salmond and his protégé, Nicola Sturgeon, who said at the time of the referendum that it was a once-in-a-generation yeah. event. He said it, they said it, they were right then. Why have they changed their mind? He is the denier. He is the denier of democracy. Yeah. And so how is the impasse likely to be resolved? Alex asked political commentators Ruth Wishart and former SNP MP George Kerevan. Ruth Wishart, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Thanks, Alec. Now, in your pre-election forecast of a month ago, you were more or less spot on. You said the SNP would make substantial gains, the unionist parties would suffer reversals. You didn't foresee the defeat of Joe Swinson, but apart from that, you got matters right. What's happened since then in Scottish politics? 
there is a standoff, as you know, because the, the Scottish National Party has said it wants a referendum this year. The uh, government in Westminster has said no way, and um, that's where we stand at the moment. Well, as you say, it's a, a standoff, a request from Nicola Sturgeon to have the so-called Section 30, to, to have a, another referendum accepted by Westminster, the point-blank refusal from Boris Johnson this week. So how does that sort of constitutional standoff get resolved? I'm not at all sure because there, there's actually quite a lot of division within the ranks of the independent supporters as to how we should proceed. There's a there's a bit of a head of steam amid, amid some supporters of the, both the government and independence that um, if Westminster keeps saying no, then we should effectively just do a UDI on the grounds that uh, the union of the parliaments in 1707 was a union between, if you'll pardon the expression, two consenting adults. It wasn't a takeover, at least it, it wasn't portrayed as such at the time. So that's one thought. The thought of the Scottish government, quite differently, is that if we have any sort of independence referendum in Scotland which doesn't have the legitimacy of the Section 30 order that you flagged up, then it won't have proper legality. And if it doesn't have proper legality, it will impinge on Scotland's ability to stay in Europe, to make a bid to become a European nation thereafter. Of course, the idea of Scottish independence being decided in a referendum it's actually a relatively new concept in Scottish politics. For, for many, many years, successive prime ministers, even Margaret Thatcher, accepted that a majority of Scottish MPs for the SNP would provoke an independent situation. Why has all that changed? I don't know. I'd really like to know the answer to that myself because even um, Alistair Jack, the Scotland Secretary, said as, as recently as last autumn that if in the in the 2021 Scottish general election there was a there was a, a majority in favour of independence, then that would be a mandate for a referendum. He, just this last weekend, he's changed his tune in that, possibly because of Boris. I think it's also interesting, Alex, to look at the Northern Ireland situation. Now, there's, there's many similarities in as much as Northern Ireland voted Remain, um, and the majority voted Remain, as indeed the majority in Scotland did. But Northern Ireland has come out of this with a very nice deal. It's got another bumper bonus coming along down the tracks. But significantly, in the Northern Ireland agreement, there was provision that if a majority of people in Northern Ireland wanted reunification, they could have a poll to decide it. And so, and that, if I remember correctly, in the legislation in Northern Ireland, they can have a poll, theoretically, every seven years, if it's in the, in the Good Friday Agreement. Is seven years good enough for Northern Ireland, but not good enough for Scotland? <laughs> Well, just the, the very fact of having a referendum, having a poll is good enough for Ireland, but not good enough for Scotland. And, of course, the other thing, I mean, I don't begrudge the Irish this at all, but the other thing is that Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, thanks to Boris's withdrawal deal, is now able to stay within a tariff-free trade agreement, within effectively still within the EU whereas Scotland is, is going to be in some difficulty there. I mean, we've already seen signs of this with the Americans putting, uh, slapping a tariff on Scottish whisky, which is, as you know, is a very big foreign earner for Scotland and indeed for the, for the exchequer in London. So what is Scotland's reaction, in your estimation, likely to be to the, the Johnston veto? Uh, is it going to be, well, we'll show him, or alternatively, will people shrug their shoulders and uh, go to the back of the bus? I don't think anybody's shrugging their shoulders anymore. And I think the fact that there were 80,000-plus people marching in... in I mean, the, the weather in Glasgow last Saturday had, you know, any self-respecting ducks looking for umbrellas. It was absolutely horrendous. But the, num the troops came out in numbers. What I would worry about, though, if, if I were Nicola Sturgeon, is you can't keep expecting people to turn out, wave their salt tyres, uh, demonstrate a high level of enthusiasm, and then do nothing. I think there will come a point where the Scottish government has got to take some firm action one way or the other. Otherwise, they, they stand to lose the support they've already built up. Now, Ruth Wishart, I'm going to push you. You got the general election result in Scotland more or less correct. Now I'm going to ask you, what's going to happen now? Well, I mean, I think the general consensus with which I agree, Alex, is that there will be no um, referendum in 2020. Apart from anything else, we learned this week from the Institute for Government that for one to happen, just in terms of the logistics, um, there would have to be an agreement on a Section 30 order by April, and that ain't going to happen, self-evidently, from what we saw this week. So there's not going to be one this year. 
The the second, uh, the fallback position, if you like, is that the uh, the 2021 Scottish uh, general election is effectively the referendum, the next referendum on independence. But the problem with that is that even if they win and win big, the, the, the Scottish government, and even if with the help of the Greens they've got a substantial ma majority in favour of independence, you still have the not inconsiderable problem of Boris saying no. And what's going to happen when Boris says no? I mean, I seem to remember that uh, Margaret Thatcher used to, to say no to uh, Scottish devolution. Yes, that's right. And the blessed canon Kenyan right of fond memory when Scotland put down its claim of right uh, to the sovereignty of the Scottish people in 1989. And he was asked the same question and he said, what have they said to, to canon uh, Kenyan right, what happens if Mrs Thatcher says no? And uh, he said, well, we're the people and we say yes. I'd like to see something similar. Ruth Wishart from Glasgow, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Alec. Josh Cavan, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Happy New Year, Alex. Now, Josh Cavan, you're both a commentator, but you're also a, a former Scottish National Party member of the Westminster Parliament. So, firstly, as a, a commentator, how would you assess this impasse, this deadlock between Edinburgh and London on the subject of the independence referendum? Well, I mean, we're, we're in uncharted waters here for the first time we have been told in Scotland um, that you cannot have a referendum ever. You, you, you're, you're part of an indivisible union and you have no say in the matter. Now, indivisible unions have, a, have, a, have a, an unhappy record of breaking up. Um, but we are in charge of what is also because after the election, um, people in the Labour Party, people outside the, the nationalist family have begun to think, well, the game's up. We want Scotland to decide where it's going. They need a bit of leadership. And I think um, there's a question mark over um, the Scottish government, which seems to have walked into a, w walked into a trap from, from uh, Boris Johnson. He's going to say no. He's going to go on saying no. So what does the government do? But, but George Kelvin, the, the First Minister says she'll be responding to the veto from Boris Johnson by the end of this month. Won't the answer come forward at, in that stage that you can all rally behind? Well, we, I mean, it's an amazing thing going on in Scotland in that people are voting with their feet. They're actually literally getting on the streets and marching. They've been marching practically every month. The beginning of January, 80,000 people in the pouring rain in Glasgow. They're looking for a leadership. And the leadership has to be something more than just waiting on Boris. That appears to be the Scottish government line. Um, you know, in Northern Ireland, they already have, in the Good Friday Agreement, uh, the constitutional right to call a referendum on the border whenever they want. Scotland is being denied that. And I think at some point, if Boris is refusing to give Scotland what Northern Ireland has, there will be civil disobedience. But in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement, isn't it a seven-year period? Now, let me see, that would be 2021 if you applied that to Scotland. Is that what you're arguing? Democracy is indivisible. If, if people, if people are, are part of a union, they get, they get the right to say whenever they want whether they continue in that union, and that is not happening. I think that the problem for the Scottish government so far is it wants to take all the decisions itself. Um, but there are new forces in, in train after the election. Uh, people of the Labour Party are shaking their heads. They want something different. We have to have some form of reaching out which goes beyond simply the Scottish government um, having, having a diktat. I think we might need some kind of institution, some kind of convention, some kind of gathering of all the political forces in Scotland that say we want the right to self-determination. And the people who are marching in the streets in Scotland, they need some kind of leadership, as we've seen in Catalonia, say, where they don't wait on the politicians, they organise themselves and they campaign themselves. If the Scottish government really has a plan, it needs to start spending some money on it. And actually, there's, there's, there's been no move from the SNP leadership to mobilise on the streets to campaign, to produce campaign literature for independence or another referendum. Um, it can't all be left to the people at Holyrood. Now, you're becoming known as the, the man with a plan after a an article you wrote in the national paper this week in Scotland. So spell out what that uh, plan is. Uh, if you think there's a, a way forward, chart it out for our viewers. There are two issues. One is the right to self-determination. The other is winning an independence majority. On self-determination, I think there are now broad forces who agree that it's Scotland's democratic right to have a referendum when it wants, if it wants. It's not something that would be imposed from London. 
Secondly, on the issue of in, winning the, the case for independence, where Scotland at the moment is split 50-50. We need to campaign on the doors. Everyone agrees on that. But the campaign has to be organized. Scottish SNP leadership is, is not actually, uh, it's, it's talking a good game, but it's not actually leading people to do anything. We need to set up a separate movement of those who want independence in the streets, separate from the politicians, who, are, who are, can organize the marches, who can raise the money, who can produce the campaign literature, who can start knocking on the doors now. We can't wait another year. We can't wait to uh, the next Holyrood elections. We need a campaign now, but the campaign has to be organized, and it has to be organized by the people themselves. George Caravan in Edinburgh, thank you very much indeed. Join us after the break to get the views of two SNP parliamentarians on how Scotland can progress the case for a referendum in the face of a Westminster veto. Welcome back. The view from Scotland from the streets and the election seems clear and determined. However, the view from Downing Street seems equally determined. So is the irresistible force meeting an immovable object? Alex spoke to former Scottish Cabinet member and Brexit rebel Alex Neil, MSP, and his former colleague and newly elected MP for East Lothian, Kenny McCaskill, to chart the road ahead. Kenny McCaskill, newly elected member for East Lothian to the Westminster Parliament. Congratulations and welcome to the Alex Salmon oh, Show. Thank you. It's good to be back. Now, yourself and the other 48 independent supporting MPs elected from Scotland, a huge election triumph, but you've arrived in Westminster making your first speech in the Palace yeah. of Westminster this week and Boris Johnson says, nah, you're not getting your referendum. So what are you going to do now? It's a democratic right of the people of Scotland to be able to decide upon their own independence. And therefore this attitude being taken by Boris Johnson that you cannot have an independence referendum ever, despite the fact they're prepared to cede one in a border poll in Ireland, is fundamentally undemocratic. So we've got to build the base, not just amongst independent supporters, but all those who cherish democracy. But when you last week suggested this... Uh new Scottish Constitutional mm -hmm. Convention, the replaying what was done in the 80s and 90s about devolution. You took a fair bit of criticism, eh, for breaking ranks, uh, and secondly, from people saying, look, we want our referendum now. We don't want another talking shop for a number of years. Well, I think, like uh, every member of the SNP, I want a referendum. If we could have it yesterday, I would have it. But the fact of the matter is, it was never going to come. Uh, I don't think I broke ranks. I simply said what uh, everybody knew, but some people chose not to, uh, uh, not to accept or to acknowledge. So I think we've got to plan or prepare. Uh, we now know that he's not accepting it. We should be doing, I think, in building that base at grassroots level because everything we do at a senior political level of bringing together, and I can say to you, I've not said it to others, I can say I've had private approaches from other members of other political parties, not SNP and Greens, who agree with this. So we've got to reach out to them, but we've got to do it not just at a national level. We should be doing this at a local level, in East Lothian, those and other political parties who agree with this, who oppose not just, as I say, the... Because it's not just Scotland's right to choose a different direction on whether we're an independent nation. It's a right to choose a different direction on membership of Europe, of a relationship with Europe, of how we impose taxation, whether we you know, look after the poor or vulnerable or cast them to the wind as Johnson's going to do. This is about getting the people of Scotland to be able to run their own country and choose their own destiny. Now, I have to press you on this. I'm no names, no pack drill, but, but which political parties and what level of seniority are these people who are saying they're prepared to at least back Scotland's right to choose? It's the Labour Party and its individual members. I won't name them. That's for them. But they've been in touch to say that they agree. So while I was getting berated with some of my own colleagues, actually I was getting the hand of friendship put out by others. We're talking parliamentarians? We're talking parliamentarians. And I think that's what we have to do. At all levels, we have to reach out to activists in the community, as we've done at elections, as we're chapping doors. But it is as particular that we bring together, whether we call it a constitutional convention, a convocation or whatever, this is how we move forward. Get the elected representatives of Scotland in there, those that choose to come, but SNP and Green will be there, I'm sure, including the person who got in touch with me, there'll be more because they've spoken out from the Labour Party and there might be others. But if a Prime Minister with a, a parliamentary majority of 80 at Westminster, he's prepared to dismiss 
an election result in Scotland. He's prepared to shrug aside mm -hmm. the loss of half of his MPs. Is he really going to be impressed if the SNP and some Labour people and perhaps the STUC and some others get together in Scotland? Is it really going to bother somebody like Boris Johnson? Well, I'm sure it won't initially. He'll uh, have some concerns, but it won't bother. But it's then the actions that we can work locally. Because at the end of the day, you and I were there at the time when Margaret Thatcher decided to bring the poll tax in on Scotland, to bring it in a year earlier from south of the border. The elected representatives, because we didn't have a Scottish Parliament, were opposed to it, but it was the people of Scotland that ultimately said no. Margaret Thatcher was brought down. The Iron Lady uh, was well and truly melted on the backs of the anti-poll tax movement. Do you not have a concern that if Boris Johnson waves a chequebook at Scotland, like he's waving a chequebook at Northern Ireland at the, the present moment, that he might turn out not to be quite as unpopular as many people in the national movement in Scotland believe? Uh, well, first of all, I don't believe that the chequebook will be waved in our direction, even if it's been uh, spent across the Irish Channel. Uh, but more importantly, I don't think he and his ilk are ever going to be popular in Scotland. They've never been popular in Scotland. I've just uh, been doing some research about 200 years ago in the Earl of Henry Dundas, who you'll remember, who was a potentate of similar measures. He too was a Tory. He represented an oligarchy of rich landowners. 200 years on, what's changed? Alistair Jack represents an oligarchy He's of the rich Scottish Secretary. He's the Scottish Secretary. He's got no more political legitimacy than Henry Dundas, and yet, as I say, he represents an oligarchy of the rich. And finally, Kenneth McCaskill, former Scottish Justice Secretary, but new boy in the Westminster Parliament. You signed up for a, a five-year term. Will you get your referendum in that five years? I believe we can. Kenneth McCaskill, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Alec Neil, member of the Scottish Parliament, Boris Johnson says no to another Scottish referendum. Did this come as a surprise to the Scottish parliamentary members? I don't think it was at all a surprise given the comments he and his colleagues have been making and the ridiculous comments made by the Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack that even if next year again we renew the mandate for an independence referendum, they still won't accept the democratic decision of the Scottish people. It's unbelievable that the Tory party has got itself into this situation. Yes, but surely the Prime Minister, whether it's unbelievable or not, can say, look, I've got a Commons majority of 80. My mandate's bigger than your mandate. You can go and whistle for your referendum. Well, two points. First of all, our mandate's actually relatively bigger than his because he got 43% of the vote. Uh, we got 45% of the vote in Scotland. But much more importantly than that, this is about the right of self-determination, which the Tory party in the past has been prepared to accept, that the Scottish people have the right of self-determination. We went into this union voluntarily. We're entitled to exit it voluntarily. And he can't stop that. And as uh, somebody once said, we are the Scottish people and we say yes, so we're not listening to Boris Johnson's neat. Yeah, but he doesn't require you to listen to him. All he requires is not to authorise another Scottish referendum. So in the bowels of the Scottish Parliament, is there a strategy to deal with the Johnston veto? And already we see people in other parties, most noticeably the Labour Party, breaking ranks with their leadership and saying, yes, the Scottish people should have the right to have a referendum and determine whether they want independence or not. And that's coming from a party who's actually going to oppose independence in such a referendum. Uh, Kenny McCaskill, the former Scottish Justice Secretary, has told us that he supports another form of Scottish constitutional convention to press the case for a referendum. Is that the sort of initiative you support? Or do you agree with those who say, well, that's another talking shop, that's more years delay, we want our referendum now? If the last time we formed a Scottish constitutional convention, it actually was very effective in forcing the issue of devolution onto the agenda. And of course, it's now 20 years since the devolved parliament was established. We could do it then, we're much stronger now because we've got a parliament and we could use that parliament as a forum to bring a wide section of Scottish society together to demand the right to self-determination. Now, you say Scotland speaking in one voice, but you yourself has been a rebel 
on European policy, you're one of the few senior SNP figures, an SNP parliamentarian, who kind of agreed with Brexit. How can you speak with one voice when you're putting forward a different point of view on the key issue of Europe? The fact that Brexit is going to happen legally at the end of this month means that we've now got to look at our future, not only in relation to the rest of the United Kingdom, but what kind of future does an independent Scotland want with the rest of Europe? My own view is, by far the best solution to that would be for an independent Scotland to become a member of the European Free Trade Association, EFTA, and that gives us the benefits of the EU without most of the downsides of the EU. And I believe we could garner a consensus for that position as well. Alec Neil, finally, what do you say to these tens of thousands of pro-referendum independence marchers in the streets of Glasgow defying the elements last weekend? These are people who are looking for immediate action, not necessarily for, for talking shops or further delay. They, they want to see the campaign progress to immediately. What's your message to them? Well, well, there's many of us been fighting for independence for 30, 40 years and even more. So I would say two things to them. First of all, I believe that we are going to win this battle and win it within the next few years. But secondly, we've got to play with the head. We've got to outmaneuver. We've got to be more perfidious than Albion itself. And that means continuing with the marches, setting up a Scottish Constitutional Convention, looking at the possibility if we're not going to get a Section 30 order to legitimise a referendum in the eyes of Westminster, is it at all possible legally to have a consultative referendum organised in Scotland? Can Westminster stop that? All of these things have to be considered, but we've got to keep the battle going and put a very clear battle plan in place, A, to get the right to self-determination through a second referendum at a time of our own choosing in the Scottish Parliament, and secondly, in that referendum, I will be fighting for an independent Scotland. Alec Neil from Edinburgh, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. There is an ancient Chinese story dating from the 3rd century BC, sometimes called the Spear and Shield Paradox. It tells of a seller of armoury being exposed when he attempted to simultaneously sell an unstoppable spear and an impenetrable shield, only to have it pointed out that Logically, both could not be valid sales. Thus, in the wake of the general election, something has to give when the irresistible force of Scottish nationalism meets the immovable object of majority government in the House of Commons. The Scottish First Minister promised a referendum this year in GDF 2020 and said that a convincing general election victory would sweep away all opposition. The victory arrived, but the opposition has stayed. However, the British Prime Minister fought the election in Scotland on opposition to these demands and lost spectacularly. It is difficult to explain a mandate to run Britain while simultaneously denying a bigger one, expressing Scotland's will. Some argue that the SNP should bide their time, prepare their case, reach out to other parties and wait until the new Johnson government hits the rocks. However, with Brexit imminent, the mood in Scotland among the independence marchers is not one of calm appraisal, but of bold and determined resolution. There is a viewpoint that, far from done, the Brexit constitutional drama is only finishing its first act with the withdrawal agreement. In comparison, however, the Scottish constitutional standoff has just started. The opening curtain is barely up on this particular Scottish play. From Wither Scotland, we will soon move to Wither the Labour Party, where the runners and riders now declared for the leadership contest. But next week, we return to the subject of housing and examine both practical action and academic study on homelessness. So for now, from Alex, me and all of the team at the show, we'll see you next week.